everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people just like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest, you can see on the screen, for some reason, they can't see me, but that's okay because I'm not that important. I'm the tech person, and you can see her, and you may not know her unless you're somehow involved in the entertainment industry, but if you watch television, I know you have seen her work. Her name is Joan Darling, and she is a pioneer in so many areas. She was the first female that was ever nominated for an Emmy for directing. She's one of the really the first female television directors, and she's done a lot of firsts. And she's a very important person to me in my life. I actually haven't seen her till today for almost probably 25, 30 years. Her name is Joan Darling. Welcome, Joan. I am so happy to see you that you're just doing oh, things you. in the world still. Yeah, I'm so happy to see you and to see all the things that you're doing. I'm just thrilled, thrilled, thrilled. Yeah, well, <clears throat> in case people don't know you, because you know, some people are younger than both of us and they might not be familiar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot yeah. younger. No so, bad news. <laughs> isn't that funny? Some people might not be familiar with the Mary Tyler Moore show, but there is an episode of that show, which is available now for free on YouTube that is considered by everyone who matters, the greatest television episode of all time. And it's called Chuckles the Clown. And you directed that episode. How does it feel to be like the director of the greatest episode of television of all time? <laughs> well, I've actually, I love the show. And I'll tell you a little story about it uh, in a minute, but <clears throat> it feels great. And you know what I love is the irony that that to be called the number one show you know, of all time. And it was directed by a woman. <laughs> That's, you know, that I thought that was really wonderfully cool. <laughs> but, but, but what happened was I was, I had done the Mary Hartman pilots, which was another show I did. And I was, um, uh, and my agents without my knowing it, sent them over to Grant Tinker, uh, who, who owned the Mary Tyler Moore company. So he hired me. Um, and I was supposed to do Georgette's wedding because I was a woman. And he had told me about the Chuckles episode. And I said, oh my gosh, I wish I could do that one. I think death is so funny. And, and what happened was that their regular director felt that the show was in bad taste and didn't want to do it. So he switched with me. And that's why I ended up getting to do Chuckles. Oh, that was, I bet he's kicking himself now. He's, <laughs> no, I think he's, still, he's a wonderful guy, an old friend, Jay Sandwich, who's his name. <clears throat> and he was their regular director. He directed all of the episodes. So, and was that the only Mary Tyler Moore episode that you directed? It was the only Mary Tyler Moore, but I directed uh, Phyllis and Rhoda and Doc, all the shows that the company did. There weren't that many female directors in television at that time. How did you break in? Well, actually there wasn't, I don't think there was anybody at that time. Um, what happened was uh, I went to see Norman Lear because I was in a television series and it was winding down. And I, I still had some, what we used to call TVQ. Now it's called likes. Um, and I had some TVQ. So I wanted to do a 90 minute movie on the life of Golda Meir from the time she was 16 to 90, I mean 60. And, um, I, I went to pitch it to Norman and I got all the way through it. And he said to me, I want you to tell this to my second in command, a man named Al Burton. So he brought him in and I told him the story and Norman turned to Al and said, I think she's the one, what do you think? I'm staring at them, I don't know what they're talking about. And Al says, I agree with you. And Norman turned to me and said, how would you like to be a director? I said, well, I don't think I know anything about it. And he said, I think that's what you really are. So I read the scripts. I loved them. I told him that I felt I needed to do my concept of the script. He thought it was a takeoff on a soap opera. I thought it was how television was destroying America. That was my take on it. So I, um, I, I read the scripts. I came back. I told him if that I didn't know since I hadn't directed whether I could deliver somebody else's concept, but I felt very strongly I could deliver my own. And when I told it to him, he loved it. And so that was how I got started. And then um, I thought I was just gonna do Mary Hartman for a lark and it was so successful. And then when uh, Grant Tinker hired me, 
uh, Chuckles was so successful that I was off and running and just had one show after another to direct after that. What was the first show you directed? The first show I directed was Mary Hartman. That was a great show as well. Yeah, that was, that was the first one. Then I did Rich Man, Poor Man at uh, Universal. And then I love, this is one of my favorite stories. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a frog in my throat. Um, I was doing Rich Man, Poor Man on the Universal lot, which is where I had been in the television series. And I was driving off the lot in my convertible uh, and uh, had the top down. And at Universal Studios, the gate was, uh, was open where you drove off the lot. And sitting on a stone wall getting the sun was Sid Scheinberg, who was second in command and running Universal. And he saw me and he yelled over, hey, Joan, what are you doing on the lot? And I said, I'm directing Rich Man, Poor Man. And he said, oh, God, he said, if only you were black. And I laughed myself silly. That's hilarious. How old were you when you started directing? Well, <clears throat> the New York Times did a piece on me. And I was, what I said was I was 41 as a director and 31 as an actress. That's incredible. You started as an actor. Is that what you originally wanted to be was an actress? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that was my life's ambition. What do you like better, acting or directing? I, that's my favorite question. <clears throat> Depends totally on the material. Some pieces of material I just really want to direct and other pieces I want to act. Because the difference is that when you're acting, you're completely involved in what your character is trying to accomplish. When you're directing, you have to sit back and watch. And you, I find it, I couldn't do both at the same time as, uh, and wouldn't want to. Yeah, I always wondered how like Clint Eastwood, how do you direct yourself? Oh, how, do you be in two, how do you be in front of the camera and behind the camera at the same time? No, he's really good at it. A couple of people, Mel Gibson did a movie called Braveheart where he directed it and, act, and starred in it. He did a terrific job. I wouldn't want to do that, not because I didn't think I could do it, but because I, I prefer the pure experience of directing, which is just watching. Uh, and I prefer the pure experience of acting, which is simply doing. Wow. So you're an acting teacher as one of the many things you do, but how did you become an actress? Were there teachers like Joan Darling that you were able to learn from? Ultimately, I, I wanted to be an actress more than anything. And I, whenever I could, when I was a kid, <clears throat> I would act. And then what happened was um, I wanted to go to Carnegie, Carnegie Tech which had a conservatory theater school. At the time, it was the best in the country. Um, and I went there and I wasn't happy with my teachers at all. I just felt like I was not learning the really the center of what acting was about. And then I went to New York and I studied with Milton Katselis and George Morrison. And the minute I walked into their classes, I went, oh, this is what I've been looking for. So then I just stole every good thing I learned from them and passed it on. You're, you're such a good teacher. When I think back to the seven years in, in your class, it almost seems in a way that you weren't really teaching acting. You were teaching people how to be human. You found me out. <laughs> you found me out. <clears throat> I've, I want, it's one of the things I love. And I feel like teaching acting is a wonderful way to do it without being, quote, a therapist but just a pal. And I feel like when people are taught acting the right way, that acting is a very healing activity because people become accepting of themselves. And I remember watching you as you worked on the acting, discover who you were. And I remember when, and I remember when you created your dog business where you were walking the dogs. My and Michael was, J. Fox was my client. Yeah. And then I, yeah. And I remember the first time that you hit it out of the park doing a scene. And then I remember you remember you started losing weight when you came to my class. And I was just sitting back and watching you as I, you know, it's like you've always been one of my children. Right. And I 
<laughs> and I'm so proud, you know. Of- That's what I felt like. And it's, it's always saying to Charles that I hope I can get through this interview without crying because you were a better mother to me than my actual mother. And <laughs> yeah, well, we, 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 we just understood each other, I felt. And I think you knew how much I, I cared about you and how much uh, re- regard and respect I had for you. And then to see you start to build your life. And I remember when you met Charles, you know, and I'm, I'm home going, oh, Abby, you met somebody. <laughs> That's, I still have the wedding present you gave me. I, I, maybe if I can run over and get it. You know, I, 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 you know, there's a saying to teach is to touch a life forever. And you yeah. forever touched my life. And I hope oh, everybody gosh. watching today will think about somebody in their life, their Joan Darling, the teacher that they remember. I've just, that it, it just, it's just, it brings me back to such a happy place because you really, through the art of acting, taught people how to be the best version of themselves. And That's exactly. you, could go, you could go to psychiatrists for the rest of your life and not get what people got. That's why, I, I mean, people loved you. I mean, I, I never met anybody that didn't love you or th- that you weren't beloved by. And, and, and it's almost like people almost never left your class. But, and you always said, you know, my wish for you is to leave, to grow up. And then one day we do, we leave the nest. But that's what it was like. It was almost like, you reparented us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad because that's really what I enjoy. And I and same thing with directing. When I'm teaching directing, one of the things that I talk about is what's most important is the quality of the experience that you provide for the actors and the crew. Because the film, actual 35 millimeter film disintegrates. <clears throat> people forget, people don't remember who stars are. But what stays with people is the quality of the experience that they've had. Yeah, yeah you, uh, that's so true. And there are so many things you said in that class that I've been able to use, because in a way I'm a teacher too. I might teach right. a specialty subject, but, but I think if I am a good teacher to anybody, it's because of things I learned from you. And you know, one, I, there's so many things that, I, I, that are coming back to me now, but one of the things that you would say a lot to people, because there were, th- this was the coolest thing about you, because you, know, you weren't, not only you were kind, but you were not pretentious at all. And as not to mention any other acting teachers, but there were at the time that you were teaching and maybe even still now there were acting teachers that were kind of full of themselves and you had to audition and they would actually yell at you. I came to you actually, it was an interesting way because and I don't know if I so much wanted to be an actress. I just wanted to be in your class, at least once I, I took it. I was taking, um, a, a, okay, let me tell you the story because you probably don't know this. I was, in 1985, I was in a commercial for the Super Bowl, but I didn't get paid. Now, being in a commercial in a Super Bowl is like the biggest commercial experience you can get. But somehow, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't get paid. And I had this commercial that appeared in the Super Bowl. So, but I wasn't an actor. I wasn't, it just, I, I lucked out. But yet, I had a lot of visibility, but I wasn't, I didn't have an agent. So, I started taking what was called a commercial acting class in Los Angeles. And the teacher said to me, well, improvisation is the finest training ground for any actor, but particularly actors that do commercials. So, if you're going to study with me and learn how to do commercials and get an agent, you first have to do improv. So I took an improv class with these wonderful people named Rex Knowles and Sherry Landro. Oh, of course, Rex. And Sherry was a student of mine. Right. I haven't seen them either in 30 years. If they're watching, hey, how you doing? Love to connect with you. (laughs) And then she was setting up your class and it was like, it was ridiculous. It was like $195. It was like nothing, you know? And she she goes, you want to take it? And I'm like, sure. And that's where I met you. And I remember had coming to your class because I had also taken improv. I don't want to say his name. I'll tell you offline with an improv teacher who was quite well known. And all he kept saying to me, like the notes after the scene was like, you suck, you suck. And I'm like, but how do I suck? Can you be more specific. And I remember telling you that, and you were saying that that's not really useful feedback because he, you know, just to yell at somebody you suck when they do a scene doesn't really help them be a better actor. So, you know, you were just so nurturing. And what was really cool, and what I remember most is I remember doing the first scene and I'd never acted before, and it was probably really terrible, but you never, all you did in the notes was tell us what we did right, literally. You never said you saw or you could do this better. And, and you said something to the effect of, well, that's how you learn through the unconscious. You reinforce. And it's like what you teach is just, it's such a good way of being with people, even with pets, like with a dog. You don't yell at your dog when they do something wrong. It's, it's like positive reinforcement. You tell them when they do something right. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and pretty soon, the, what happens is you, the, that people like 
doing it right. They like being told that's good. So they do more of it. And then, and the more of it they do, pretty soon the whole time of the event is taken up and doing positive things. And the, the negative things just disappear. It's such a great way to teach. And it's just, it's just, you don't have to be afraid to go to class. Like in some of these, oh, classes yeah. where nobody likes to be yelled at. I'm not even sure that works, especially for a creative process. It's like, it's like when I help people with weight loss, how effective is like, well, you, you shouldn't have eaten that. You're, you know, I mean, that's not going to help them lose weight. Right. And yell exactly. at them for, you know, I don't think that works, but I know we know there's some teachers like that. Do you think that anyone can learn to act? Oh, Absolutely. Absolutely. I think anybody, I think it, when people say to me, they used to say to me, well, do I have it? You know, you know, my answer always was how much do you want it? I know. And Joan, that's so true for everything with the people that I work with on weight loss. I, I you know, I wrote about you in my first of four books. I mentioned, oh, really? you. I guess I'll, I'll, I, I, if I can grab it, I will, but I did talk to you. I mentioned you because you, that, I remember that because it's the same thing, even with something as difficult as weight loss and, ma and management, you have to want it. It doesn't, you have to want it. And the people that really, really want it eventually will achieve it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, that's what I did is I just, I kept uh, fighting with my teachers at Carnegie. I remember I got an A minus in acting one year and the guy who was in charge of the acting department, I went in and I said, why did I get an A minus? You haven't given me any notes about what, how to make it better. And he just started to laugh and said, Joan, he said, your A minus is political because there were teachers who didn't want me to have a swelled head. So they wouldn't give me an A. And I was saying, if, if you can't tell me what to do to improve, you have to give me an A. That's hilarious. Yeah. I, I, I remember so many people saying to you, D D Joan, have I got it? And then, you know, mm -hmm. have I got what? Have I got, what was so interesting about your class is that there were so many people that were so good that never really went on with a career. Right. And yet there are people that you see with careers that were <laughs> anywhere as good as the people that came out of your class. Yeah. So, so that, that's you know, is really how bad do you want? Having a great career and being a great actor are not always the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And also there's luck involved. I mean, one of the strange things that I feel about my life was there were some performances I gave that were really top of the line. Um, I did a show called The Defenders and I had a great part, absolutely great part. Um, you know, once in a lifetime part. And I really just absolutely did it fantastically. And I started getting letters from people in California saying, you're gonna get an Emmy. We're gonna make sure you're nom everybody sees this and you get nominated for an Emmy. <clears throat> so I thought, well, that's great. Well, that year they didn't give Emmys for performance. It's the only year that they honored Barbara Streisand and Leonard Bernstein. So the, at that time, if you won an Emmy, your career was made because it hadn't been around that long. So that didn't happen. And then I did a, um, a show that Spielberg directed uh, where it was a very serious show um, and I got incredible reviews and the film disappeared. Now, neither Spielberg nor I could get a copy of the show. Nobody could find it. It finally showed up about three years ago at the Museum of Broadcasting. But how weird is that, 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 it, that it would just disappear? So that happened. Then I did a play in New York where I really thought I was pretty hotsy totsy And it was in a building that had nothing but theaters in it. And our theater was on the fourth floor. It was a very famous building. A week before we were to open, the elevator broke. So no critics wanted to walk up four flights to see the play. So it wasn't reviewed. And then I came in second for Rhoda in Mary Tyler Moore. I would have, uh, Valerie came in first, I came in second. So if I'd gotten that, I'd have had a whole other career. So I think that what happened to me was that in a way, my destiny was to be the first woman director. My destiny was to step into that void. And when they first asked me to direct a whole season, I wasn't interested. I still wanted to be an actress. I wasn't that interested in it, but I felt, well, I'm going to do it for one year so that to prove that a woman can direct, because I, I knew there was 
no way that I could do a show on. I knew I could do a show on time. I knew I could make a crew be happy to work with me. I knew all that. I had no idea whether it was going to be any good or not. And so um, uh, when, when after Mary Hartman hit so big and then Chuckles hit so big, I had 15 years of nonstop directing work. But my goal was really just to do it for one year so it would be established that a woman could direct. And then I'm very proud because um, Randa Haynes, who directed um, uh, Children of a Lesser God and was nominated for an Academy Award for it, first woman, not first woman, but uh, yeah, I think she was the first woman. And then well, Kate was in my class and Leslie Linker Gladder, who was the um, executive producer and director of Homeland. And, you know, these are great pals of mine. We see each other every year if we can. But uh, I really sort of set a tone. I, that was what I wanted to do, is I wanted to get rid of the idea that a woman wasn't strong enough or smart enough or whatever they didn't think we could do, that a woman could do a director show. That's amazing. Do, do people acknowledge this about you? Like, are there people that really know how you really paved the way for them to be yeah. able to do this? Yeah, there are the people who start, came and studied with me because there was no place for them to study especially, you know, to study with a woman director and they were a woman trying to break in. Um, but this, yeah, I've gotten a lot of um, very satisfying um, appreciation. But the weirdest thing, and I, I, I don't even know whether to say that. You know what drives me crazy? Is women in film has never honored me. Well, how can we do that? Can we write them? I mean, yeah, I'll write I, them I, and tell them. I really feel because they've honored so many people that I trained or that I helped get jobs. And I really feel like, hey, wait a minute, women in film. I was a charter member. I was one of the first members. And they've never, you know. We've got to rectify this. If you tell yeah. me how to get in touch with them, I'll ask all my people to write them. That's just not fair. <laughs> That's great. I love that. <laughs> I, I, I'll do it. I, will, I will be a one woman campaign and spearhead them now that I know that that's something that you want. Yeah. It's women in film. That's the organization. Yeah. When you direct people, is it similar to how you work with people when they're in your acting class? Is it a similar type of experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's fun. It's silly. There's, there's no such thing as a mistake when, you know, when I'm working with an actor, I want their contributions. Um, I'm very playful, but I can do things when I'm directing someone who, you know, obviously knows how to act or is, you know. Um, I can do more magic when I'm on a set because I want the actors that I'm teaching to own what's happening so they can repeat it and do it on their own. Whereas when I'm directing, sometimes I'll do little sneaky things that will set a performance just into the right space. And, um, and so, yeah, but the, but the attitude is the same, which is we're all here to have a good time and play with this and make it as good as we can. You know, I never quite broke into show business, but th that would have been my dream to be able to be directed by you. We have somebody watching live named Ashley Maria, who says, oh, Joe, of course. <laughs> in the documentary film, Pioneers in Skirts. I love her. She was my teacher at UNC and we stayed in touch. So happy to hear her telling more stories, as is everyone. I had no idea that you would, you were up for the part of Rhoda. I can totally see that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I wouldn't have been a director. If that had happened, I'd have never been a director. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So, so think, yeah. Do you think that that some people just want to be famous more than they want to be an actor? Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> and the younger generation more than your generation or my generation. And Ashley Marie, if you're listening, I love you. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, uh, I forget what we what yeah, were. Yeah, if, if some people, especially now with YouTube, I should talk, I'm on YouTube, but that it's more important. They just want to be famous, but they don't really yeah. want to learn the craft and be an actor. Yeah, no. And the same thing with the writing on YouTube, because uh, I've taught for YouTube a couple of workshops. And, but as the, see, YouTube's very interesting. The younger kids understood immediately that they could actually see themselves on their television sets if they made something for YouTube <clears throat> and they knew how to do it and they knew how to put things on YouTube. The older generation went YouTube 
But after they saw all these people on YouTube, they began, the people who wanted to write and tell stories discovered YouTube. And now there's some fabulous stuff on YouTube. Yeah, like this right now, you, <laughs> as we speak. Absolutely. You know, you, one of the stories you often told, and I don't, I don't, I'm not going to tell it correctly, but it all, all, always stuck with me. It was a story about, I believe it was Hal Holbrook, what happened to him when he became oh. successful. And I feel like that story. I feel like that story. Oh, <clears throat> I know exactly, I know exactly the story. It, uh, it's that, he became all of, a star overnight in New York uh, doing a show called Tonight with Mark Twain. And he was doing it in nightclubs for, uh, you know, and in coffee shops. And then he rented the Cherry Lane Theater with his own money. And he sent out flyers with his own money and <clears throat> did everything on his own. And the night of the opening night, he was busy folding the chairs up so the theater looked neat and sweeping the floor. And then he went backstage and somebody else took the tickets and sold the tickets. And the next morning, he was the biggest star in New York overnight. Just everybody discovered him. And I know exactly what you're talking about. He felt because he had created it for himself that it didn't count. He felt it had to be given to him for it to count. But you can be as proud as Hal Holbrook should have been. You know, but sometimes it just feels like that that I did everything myself. Nobody helped me get to where I am. Really, like you know, no, no. It, so it, I, I know what you mean. I kind of I kind of fantasize. Wouldn't it be nice to be like Lana Turner and just be having a milkshake somewhere and somebody <laughs> say, "Here, you know, yeah. it doesn't work like that, does no, it?" No, it doesn't. But also, you'd never be as good at what you do, or have as much fun. Wow. You know. And yeah. another thing you'd say, you said a lot, and again, what I've, the, what you taught in acting class are really lessons for life is how that when it comes, you'd say something to the effect of like, let's say two actors, you were directing something and you had two actors up for the same, for the, for the part. And they were pretty much of equal talent that you would always pick the one that you were going to have the better experience with at the end of the yeah. day, or, or if that one was maybe slightly less, you'd still pick that one. And it's so true in business and in life, you, 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 even yes, you want the best quality, but if somebody's not, not going to be fun to work with or disagreeable, you, and, and that was very helpful as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm so glad. Yeah. Because I really believe what we were talking about before, this is the time of our life. And I don't think anything is worth creating or having a miserable time. You know, and this is a very odd time for everybody. What a miracle that, that, the Zoom has been invented and FaceTime to help see us through this terrible time, this pandemic and this terrible time in our lives. That, but we can still, I can see you, Abby. I, know. I haven't seen you in 30 years and I can see you. Isn't that cool? I don't know what took me so long to get, to get in touch with you. I guess I feel like if you're not in the class, you shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't bother um, you. But Speak but, up. <laughs> but man, like just that we were talking a little bit before, uh, before logging on live and talk, there's the possibility of you maybe doing an acting class online. I would, I would so take it, you know, I yeah. would like, I'd be, I mean, I would make everybody <laughs> take it because I, I think that would be an amazing experience. Another thing I loved so much about your class is that you, you took people of different levels and you mixed them all together in the stew. Like right. you didn't, it wasn't like, oh, you had to be at this level. You didn't have to audition. And I remember that, yes, there were people in your class that were famous, people on television. There were, I went, when I was in your class, Ann Archer was in your class the same time she was nominated for an Academy Award. But at the same time, I remember there was an anesthesiologist who wanted to give a, give a try <laughs> to acting. There was a seven-year-old girl. It was like a melting pot. And I think that was also nice because you didn't feel like you had to be this great, you know, actor to, to, to try. Yeah. Yeah. And I liked it. I mean, I thought it was wonderful for everybody, you know, what a great thing. This guy was not only was he an anesthesiologist, he was head of anesthesiology at Cedar sinai He was a big, big time. And there was also a gastroenterologist who, if, who took the class because he, he was very funny. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you remember him or not. Um, but he was he did stand up a lot. He loved doing stand up in the class. Yeah. You know, another thing I admire about you is your your roots really started in improvisational comedy. You were again, you are the life of many firsts, Joan, really. 
you, you, you should be honored just for being a pioneer, but you were in pretty much an all male improv troupe a long yes. time ago before right. improv was like it is now. Tell us yeah. about that. That must have been really fun. But oh, Henry, that, I think, was in it, right? <clears throat> yeah, that it, it was so wonderful. I, a friend of mine had been in a theater in St. Louis with a man named Ted Flicker. And Ted Flicker came to New York. He had a company, an improv company, and that had Mike and Elaine in it and Shelley Berman in it. And he decided to bring them to New York. This before improv even existed. And when he got to New York, the money that he had to open the show with Mike and Elaine fell through. So Mike and Elaine started playing nightclubs and um, he started an improvisational theater. And my friend told him, if you ever do improvisational theater, you really should you know, see my friend Joan Darling and audition her. And I went in to audition. It was a show called The Premise, which had great people in it. Um, Gene Hackman was in it. George Siegel was in it. Um, uh, Ron Liebman was in it. It had just a great, great number of people who came through. Buck Henry. So anyway, um, I went into audition for Ted and I felt like, oh my God, I was born to do this. This is what I was born to do. And I auditioned for him and he later said, within 30 seconds, I was hired. And he, talk, he talks about what I did that made him hire me. And then I went in and the company that I was in was a man named Tom Aldridge, who uh, the first company was Tom Aldridge, who was um, the original man in On Golden Pond on Broadway, uh, Jim, uh, uh, Buck Henry, myself, George Siegel and Ted Flicker. Um, and it was, I absolutely loved improvising because it was so much closer to the bone it, you had to, I had to really, same thing that you loved about it. You had to be in touch with yourself and you had to be willing to jump, which was the most fun. And that show was at first, it was a big hit in New York. And then Second City came from Chicago and played just down the street from us. So they played nightclub hours, we played theater hours. So their people would come down and act on our stage with us when we did our show at theater times, then we would all walk down the street and be in their show. So it was a family, great family of people who improvised and, and that show, our show was very successful. Needless to say, Second City was very successful. Wow, I, I, there's probably no tapes available. I would love to see you as an improviser. There's no way to see that, right? I'm trying to think, I don't think, there is a record, a, a 33 and a third record of it of sketches with the premise. You probably can find it. That would be amazing. Do you think that, you know, what I notice is I, I take improv classes and stand-up classes when we don't have a pandemic, I take them in person. There is, I, I live in the, the desert now, there's Coachella Valley Repertory Theater, but now I'm doing them online. But I find that people that are quote actors, they're so afraid of stand-up and improv. And to me, acting is the most boring of the three. <laughs> I agree, totally. Well, and also when I first stopped, you know, when I first took up uh, improv, I, no, I had been, excuse me, I had been in the improv theater for four years and then I was in a Broadway play and I resented having to change how I felt and what I was thinking about to fulfill the written word. I loved having to having to just get in touch with myself and express it. So it was like a chore. The acting was a chore. Yeah, you know, it's funny because like when I would do a scene in your class, it would be really, really fun. And, I, you know, I would enjoy it. But then to have to do it again, it was like, I don't want to do it again. Right. You, know? <laughs> you were a one take wonder, right? <laughs> that's right. And that's why I think I resonate more with improv. But so many people are so afraid of it. They feel like it's acting without a net. That, that, and they're that right. They like having the lines. And yeah. to me, the lines are the worst part because it's like. <laughs> they get in the way. Yeah, that, it's true. And, and the thing is, I think. For every actor to do to work on impro improvisation the way we used to do it, uh, it improves their acting so much because it really teaches them not only to do the work to create what's happening with the character and all wake it up in themselves, but they also have to be able to go moment to moment with what's actually happening. And the combination of the two is what makes really great actors. Yeah. Like somebody like Alan Arkin came out of 
Yeah. Oh my God, he is one of my absolute favorites. I adore him. So a lot of people are saying, is, is, will Joan teach a Zoom class? Just so we goes on the record, I'm very good at setting things up and promoting other people's stuff. I do this for my stand-up teacher. So guys, I'm going to talk offline with her and try to get her to do yes. something. And that would be absolutely amazing. Oh, I would love that. We'll talk together and, and uh, set something up. Well, you know, you're also another first, you're really what I would call a triple threat. People might know now that you are an actress and a director, but you also wrote, you wrote a very, very famous, hilarious episode of one of my all-time favorite shows, The Dick Van Dyke Show. I mean, and you did this before women were doing any of this. I know, I know. I love that show, the one that I wrote, that I wrote, uh, and, and Carl Reiner hired me because he'd seen me improvise. And he was looking for a writer who wouldn't just write jokes, but knew what performance comedy was. So yeah, and, uh, and they gave us the um, they gave uh, us the uh, premise of that show, and I just thought it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. That they were, you know, the idea of the show with the rock in the basement. That yeah. was so, and I love that show. So, do you have any high? What are some of the highlights from your career, other than the obvious chuckles, the clown? But do you have any other highlights of either people you work with or experiences you had? That you know, why don't you write a book? I can help you with that. Actually, yeah. I teach business classes, and I help people. Oh, go great! Their- well, actually, I have about a hundred pages of a biography, and I and I think it was a friend of mine, Joan Tewksbury, a wonderful uh, writer, teacher. She wrote Nashville. And she uh, she teaches at Sundance, and she's um, a good director. And we were pioneers at the same time. Uh, but she said to me that I should write a book, and I started it. Uh, I said, "Well, why should I write a book?" And she said, "Well, because you were the first woman director, and you really should chronicle that." So I, I sat down, and then I realized, and this is what's really interesting: uh, when I first came to New York as an actress. Um, I went with and married Eric Darling, who became a very famous folk singer. And we were in the village together at the, for, the, uh, for the 60s. And in the village at the 60s, there were, people weren't doing drugs, so everybody was really on top of their game. And the people who were around hanging out were Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, Eric Darling, Pete Seeger, this is all on the folk side, Bill Svano, my current husband, who was on, in the Rooftop Singers. Um, uh, uh, Dick, Dick Cavett was doing stand-up. Woody Allen was doing stand-up. Louise Lasser was doing stand-up. Um, it, uh, Bill Cosby was doing stand-up in the village. All, everybody was, nobody, Buck Henry was in the village. Uh, out of that early period, in the early 60s, came Peter, Paul, and Mary, came all of the huge acts and also the comedy minds all came, like Buck Henry wrote um, Get Smart with Mel Brooks and and, and, uh, won some Academy Award nominations for um, screenplays he wrote. But that it was like this giant group of people, all of whom knew each other. We were all pals. We all hung out at the coffee houses. We all watched each other perform. And then gradually we all went to California and they became the guiding light of the 70s and 80s and 90s in um, Hollywood. All the big, so nobody has chronicled that. Nobody has written about that because a lot of times what they would talk about is after drugs came in in the 60s, it changed. But the early 60s was a hotbed of everybody who like Alan Arkin was part of that. Mike and Elaine, everybody, you know, was in, in New York starting out at the same time. And it was a very benevolent place. Everybody knew everybody, everybody helped everybody. So in that part, nobody's written that, that part of it. Well, if you do write a book, do you think you'll call it Let Yourself Laugh? <laughs> no, I, I, let me see. What, I don't know whether, I know what, I know what the chapter about the 60s in the village is. It's called It Takes a Village. <laughs> and uh, um, no, but let yourself laugh is uh, I, for my acting book. It's called the Chickhead School of Acting. Let yourself laugh. Did you write an acting book? I'm or- working on it. Uh, right. but one of my problems is I know so much that I, to organize it is really difficult. But I've been playing around with it. 
Well, if it, you know, people, if you haven't watched Chuckles the Clown, it's available free on YouTube because if you watch that episode, you'll understand what let yourself laugh means. And that's something that Joan uses in her class a lot, which really won't make sense to you unless you see that episode. And it didn't make sense to a lot of the actors because they just never wanted to trust that. that, that yeah, what, I would beat them into it. <laughs> you know, and if, would... you know, if we could only do that in life too. Yeah, that, right. <laughs> you know, that we can't really do that in life because if we really laugh every time we feel like sometimes that might be inappropriate, especially in this day and age. But in acting, it's great because it gives you such freedom because la laughter is just really often something that's uncomfortable. And then if you can allow yourself to do that, you get to the real emotion, just like Mary did in the Chuckles the Clown episode. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. exactly yeah. right. Boy, you, you really paid attention. Oh, hey, seven years. I remember that, I, you know, I, I never understood people in that class. They would show up for their scene and leave. I would be the first one there at eight o'clock and the last one at six o'clock. I mean, I had to get a dog sitter. I would not miss a class all the whole time that, that you were teaching it. It was just, it was really like, it was really the greatest show in town. And I'll never forget the time that Steven Spielberg came in just to watch. And Pat Sansoni was doing a monologue and all of us were like, why can't we be the ones on the stage now? <laughs> and the thing is, is we were so none you know he even like said something to you like what's wrong with these people nobody will talk to me because we, we out of respect we ignored him we figured he didn't want us to talk to him okay. but I'll never forget that yeah and, and not only that he is he's one of the nicest men on the planet he and I and Bill my current husband were friends before uh he was Stephen you know before he was Spielberg we we the, and I we for the second show I was talking about the serious one that disappeared he directed me in that and that's where we met and he was 23 years old when I met him you know that's amazing that's amazing yeah. so Holly who's watching live has a question how can we have more confidence when we're in front of the camera oh <laughs> let's see well the first it, it has to do with um the understanding I'm going to what I often say to directors who, are, who talk about being nervous, and, and I'll say it to an actor too, your ethics are to the story. And if you really know what's happening in the scene and you have the skills or just kind of know to wake up things in your life that you've experienced that are similar to what happens in the scene. And if you know what it is your character is trying to accomplish in the scene, your job is just to accomplish it. It doesn't matter whether you're frightened. It doesn't, it, it, as I say, when I say the ethics is to the story, to your character, that you can be frightened, you can be angry, you can be sad, you can be anything, but you still have to try to get the bank loan if that's what the scene is about. So if you can figure out what is the scene about, what am I trying to do? Um, and find some way to connect it up to things in yourself that are similar to what the character is going through. And then just don't worry about being frightened. Don't worry about being confident. Worry about getting the bank loan. Try to get the bank loan. I, I remember you used to say when a monologue, who are you telling this story to and why are you telling it now? Kind of like Passover. Why is this? Night yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I take a lot of what you talk because, you know, I'm not an actor in the, you know, like on TV, but I do a lot of presentations. And so a lot of what I learned in your class was just very helpful to public speaking. Like I've never really had to go to Toastmasters because I had so much experience just doing that and, and taking the advice that you would teach us for scenes just in presentations, you know, right. thinking about who I'm telling this story to. To and why am I telling it now? And that's, that is really helpful. Cause like you say, you know, I, it's not that I never get nervous. It's just that that it, my nerves are less important than what exactly. I'm doing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And I also think acting is teaching is you say, Hey, audience, look at this, see what he, see what Iago does and, and how, uh, how, how, what kind of a, a person you don't want to be, or see how, some character overcomes some obstacle and says, see, you can be like that. So if you think another thing that is, I forgot that, but if you think about acting as you're showing people, you're teaching people by showing them what different characters are like. And it's the same thing in public speaking is you really have something that you want somebody to understand who are you telling this to, why are you telling it to them now? 
this is interesting. Katie posted that Steven Spielberg's father just passed away today at 103, that there is an obituary, uh, obituary in the New York Times. So thank you for sharing that, Katie. Oh, so yeah. I guess you'll get, that's amazing. Is that one of, that's congratulations yeah. on his long life. Um, what's in interesting about you is that you were able to do so much in terms of acting. You did the improv, you did dramatic acting, but you could do Shakespeare. Like, I think that is really hard. Like oh. I remember taking your Shakespeare class and that was like, oh my God, this is really iambic pentameter, an old Olympics towering <laughs> up, a and German and fruits, some hops. Oh my God, short, long, short, long, short, long. <laughs> that was one thing that I just was, I am not suited for. How, yeah. how are you able, you really are, you, you are, you're you're a jack of all trades and a master of all the trades that you are a, that's that's really rare to be so good at so many different things oh thank you thank you yeah it was um well it's fun you know what it is is something comes along and it looks like fun to me the one thing if you would ask me God, now i'm really aware of it and this will make you laugh i think um i wished i had worked on singing i wished i had worked on singing you know, and I sort of forgot about it. And I know I probably would have had a pretty good career in musicals if I'd ever really taken the time to learn how to sing. But I went to see Bohemian Rhapsody about Queen. Now, I had never heard one or uh, was aware of one note of Queen. And when I saw that, I then went on YouTube and I started finding the real Freddie Mercury the, the lead singer in Queen. And I went, oh my God, now I want to be a singer. But I think at my age, I don't think I have enough time left. But, uh, but that was the one thing that I wish I had worked on more, worked on. Well, are you, are you, able, to, are you able to tell your age? Oh, sure. <laughs> Let me see. One, two, three, no, yeah. eight, 85. That's amazing. I met you when you were 55. I remember exactly. Yeah. I was I was 25 at the time. That is amazing. Well, and I don't think it's too late. And, and especially, I think you, I, you don't want to die with the music still in you. So why not take a class? You know, yeah. I teach at a place called Rancho La Puerta. It's a spa in Mexico. And there was some famous, they think a lot of people they're teaching. And I, I can't, which you're not, I don't remember her name right now, but she, she's like a Broadway actress and she taught singing there. And I, I and I, I, I'm not a singer, but I took her class and I sang in front of people. I don't think I want to do that again, but, but you definitely, <laughs> they definitely should do it. it yeah, you know? no, I was thinking that. I was thinking, wait a minute. What? Well, first of all, I cannot believe my age and I certainly can't believe yours. I know, 60. It's ridiculous. <laughs> this is the oldest that both of us have ever been. Yeah, yeah that's right. And, and then it's only just beginning. We're going to keep getting older. Oh, but I'm God. so grateful because I still have the energy for teaching, for sure. I have the energy for... Um, if the right part comes along, I did something last January, I guess it was just a three page part that somebody had sent to me as a lark. And I, I loved the part so much that I went ahead and did an audition tape without the director knowing me or asking me and sent it off to him because I just wanted to play this part. Um, but it, it uh, I, I, it's just, you know, I, I agree with you. It's silly for me not to go ahead and do it. I, I'm so grateful that I'm still here and healthy with enough energy to do this, enough energy to teach a class, you know. That's well, really I good. think we need to add Academy Award to your list of accomplishments because remember, Ruth Gordon didn't win hers till she was 80. Grandma That's Moses right. didn't start painting till 90. And, and you already have the talent and there's not a lot of competition now for you. Right. In your oh, and also, so you know, Elaine May won a Tony at 87, I think. She just won a Tony. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jennifer, who's watching live, says, does Joan have a favorite television show that's on now? Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> well, it's on now. Um, I would say my favorite is Yellowstone, which is absolutely incredible. Both uh, the, the writer, Taylor Sheridan, wrote a movie called Helen High Water. And he's a fantastic screenwriter. And he's written every episode of this show. Kevin Costner is the lead and it takes place in Montana, but or Wyoming, which is it of the two. Uh, but it's an, it's an extraordinary, it's extraordinarily entertaining, but it's also classic iconic dynasty love of the land story with some of the best shooting in a television series I've ever seen. And also, even though it's not, uh, 
The first three seasons of Better Call Saul, I thought were, were just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. That's amazing. Were there ever any actors that you would have liked to have worked with that for some reason you didn't? There's still time, but is there anybody on your bucket list to work with either either acting with them or maybe directing them? Other than uh, Chef AJ, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Chef AJ, of course, of course. See, I'm trying to think. Um, where I met him and worked with him uh, as an advisor at Sundance, um, first person who just popped into my mind without thinking about it is Denzel Washington. Um, but let me think about who I, God, I, well, I adore Kevin Spacey's acting, although he's a little bit out of it at the moment. Right. Um, trying to think, let me, let me ponder it. Yeah, you can think about that. And then I'll, as, as I think up answers, I'll email them to you. Absolutely. Or, yeah. or just uh, address acting. Well, you've, you've acted with some, some really great, I mean, especially in your improv days, the, all those people would have been amazing to do improv comedy with. Yeah. yeah. And of course, I, I mean, Gene Hackman is such an old friend and we've worked together, but I find him the most extraordinary actor. I would love to have directed him. Um, yeah, I you can, directed a really funny movie with Howard Storm. I, I can't remember. What was, it, what was the name of it? That was excellent. I can't, I don't remember what it was. But, but he was like playing a psychiatrist and he fell asleep. He looked like he fell asleep, but he died. Didn't you direct him in that? I don't know. Somebody that. watching, go on IMDb and see if Joan directed a movie with Howard Storm. Howard Storm directed me in a play years okay. ago before he became a director. You know, he directed the play to make a, um, uh, like a piece of work that he could show to get directing work in television. And we've been old, we're old pals, Howard and I. How, how have you seen either television change or the business change for better or for worse since you started? Well, when I was directing, the director was considered an integral part of the creative process on the shows, most of them, uh, especially at MTM. But as television went, uh, went on, what happened was the producers, the showrunners, and the writers really took over all of the creative part of the, the show and only wanted traffic cops for, uh, for directors. So that was one thing that I saw. There's been a huge change actually for the better um, with streaming. And what, because if you worked for a network or a big studio, you always went through a development process, which was five people telling you what your film should be as you worked on it. Um, with streaming doesn't have development departments, but they don't pay you anything for developing something, but you get to write exactly what you want and then take it to them. So the level of the writing is much higher in the streaming services now. The, the movies have really degenerated into um, superheroes, you know, uh, robots, all kinds of things like that. Very few um, uh, really movies worth getting out of your house and getting yeah. out of the lounger, <laughs> putting aside the popcorn and driving 30 yeah. minutes to a movie theater. Absolutely. You know. the, I, I Google it. It was called The Check is in the Mail and you directed oh, yes. it with oh, Ann Archer, I'm Brian right. Dennehy and Howard Storm. Right. I forgot all about that because it was a terrible experience. It was, but it was a funny movie. At least the scene with Howard was hilarious. Yeah. And uh, it had, I, I got my revenge. I had terrible problems with the producer writer. Just terrible. He was really just a terrible person. I won't get into that. But he reshot some scenes after I had finished the movie, com some comedy scenes. And, and, uh, but the leads in that movie were Brian Dennehy and Ann Archer playing a husband and wife. And they had some scenes, fight scenes and things um, that were really fabulous. They were fabulous in it and the scenes were really good. And when the movie came out, um, the review said that Joan Darling directed the comedy scenes like the Joker is wild. They named all the scenes I didn't do. And then said, but the marital scenes were as good as, um, uh, what's his name? scenes from a marriage, Bergman's scenes from a marriage. 
So that was my revenge. All the things that they'd left in that I'd done got good reviews and whatever he put in that got a bad review. You directed a critically acclaimed movie with Susan Day though. Remember that one? Yes, yeah, First Love. Yep. And well, there you was, you know, on YouTube, if you Google my name, on YouTube, if you, you look, put my name in, there's a compilation. Of, well, the first thing that comes up is it has the first scene from The Defenders, which I acted in, and it has a couple of scenes from, from First Love, so a scene from Mary Hartman, and a, and, Chuck, and a scene from Chuckles. So it's like a little potpourri that was done for an award ceremony that, uh, where I got an award. So if you, anybody wants to go and look at my evil doings. <laughs> I would love to look at them. And you know, if Let Yourself Laugh isn't a good title for your book, another title I could think of is I Did It My Way because you, you really have had a remarkable career, a wonderful life, and you never had to sell yourself out to have success. And you yeah. really did do it your way. You know, and, and it was almost impossible. And one of the reasons why I backed off as the television directing changed to where you were just to do the blocking and not do anything creative with the actors. I stopped doing it because, um, you know, again, I come back to the thing of how do you want to spend the time of your life? And I wanted to spend it having a good time, like right now, for instance. I have learned so much from you, that It's just <laughs> really, you know, there's, a, there's a, a book called Everything I Learned in Life I Learned in Kindergarten, but I would say everything important I learned in life I learned in Joan Darling's class. Oh, thank you, my friend. Yeah, you're amazing. And now I got to get you back in the game. Now that I've connected with you, I'm never going to let you go. You know, I am thrilled. I can't tell you, I think I wrote you how thrilled I was when I got that letter from you. Because I think about you a lot and I'm, I'm, you know, as I say, you're very, very dear to me. And, well, you, and as we say in our heritage, I quell over how much you've accomplished. Well, if people knew how many lives, I mean, I, not that I expect you to go anywhere soon, but man, if you did, if I, I just, there, you have touched so many lives. And like I said, you've made people better versions of themselves. And what I wish for everyone is that they find their Joan Darling, that everybody has somebody that sees the potential in them, that sees the good in them, that can nurture them, especially if they didn't get it from their family. And yeah. another thing, probably the most important thing I learned from you is that family is not who shares your genes in your blood. It's, I mean, yes, it is technically, but family is the one that you create. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, well, I could talk to you forever, but I'm gonna stop now because as you know, we always wanna leave them wanting more. That's a tenant right, show business. <laughs> and, and hopefully we're gonna create something, even if it's, a, I mean, I, I'm, I'm such a good promoter of other people's stuff. I can- Well, that's great that. because I need somebody to help me get organized. Oh, yeah, that, well, that, that is one thing. I, I'm not saying right. my own stuff, but I'm good because I've helped my stand-up teacher fill his class and I, I think I can do it. And, and you guys share this broadcast with people so that they know that uh, she's coming back. and. Yep. I'm in that. And we got to get that book out too, because you, 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 you have, you have to have a book out. Before. You just do, because you know, why, why not a Nobel prize too, but we got to get you, <laughs> we got to get you an Oscar. We got to get you in women in film. If you tell me how to do that, we will start a letter writing campaign. Right. Because, uh, you know, the first, the first television director nominated for an Emmy and so many firsts, such an extraordinary life. And yet it's not over. You're, you're now having another chapter. So right. Yeah. Well, I'm thank you so good. much, Joni. It's been All amazing right. talking to so you. So good to see you. Oh my God. I love been, you. And I'm so I love glad. you too. And you have made such a difference in my life. And uh, I, I appreciate all that you do for the world and, and everything. So, and thank you guys so much for watching. Please come back tomorrow, 11 a.m. when my guest is Dr. Jen Hawk, and she'll be talking about trauma. So today oh. was drama and tomorrow well, is drama. <laughs> <laughs> and, and say hi to Bill. Take care. Hi, Bill, honey. Say hello to Charles for me. Bye. Bye.